Well, guys, maybe we, we can kick it off now. Uh, what do you say, Mark? Uh, yeah, let's do it. All right. So uh, first thing, thank you everybody for joining us. I know everybody's probably tired of jumping on Zoom calls and, and webinars. Um, we're trying to add some value, provide something that's useful, it's helpful in your day-to-day, -day, and whether you're a big company, a small company, or an individual, um, at the end of the day, what we want you to do is walk away from this with something that's useful to you. So uh, real quick, um, there's a reason we're all on here, <laughs> and that reason is a little thing called Oil and Gas Global Network. You'll see the initials OGGN. Uh, this is part of our team here that are, are going to help educate and, and probably entertain you a little bit. So if everybody could take just a second and uh, introduce themselves and, and tell the audience what role you play, and we'll get into the meat of it in just a minute. Let's start with Alex. Yeah, so I'm, uh, I guess my role at OGGN first, yes. Correct. Okay. Yes. Um, <laughs> I am, so I started at OGGN, it's been a year now, and uh, my position or my job basically is just social media oversight and um, general things kind of of that nature that Tim or Mark need as far as different branding things or communications regarding social media. Yeah. So that's our LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter fall under me. Awesome. Catherine. Well, hey, y'all. I am Catherine Mills. I am located in Denver, Golden, Colorado. Um, I joined the OGGN team sometime last year, September of last year, I think, technically. I am director of the West, or uh, now director, I think, of the United States for our events and happy hours, and I am their executive producer. So I uh, handle our communications from our host to our editor and then get them out to y'all live. So <laughs> it's, one, it's one of the things I do. <laughs> it's happening. Many hats, yeah. Many hats. Uh, my name's Tim Taylor. I'm located in Houston, Texas, and I am a director of marketing for OGGN. Uh, started about a year, a little over a year ago, right, Mark? Yeah. Uh, can't believe it. Time flies. And uh, yeah, so I've been on the team uh, for a little over a year, and it's been great. Um, it's been great working with uh, Alex and Catherine, uh, I think we built a, a unique team here, so it's been, it's been awesome. Yeah, th th these are my rock stars, everybody. So um, what we're going to try to do today is go over a couple of things. <clears throat> we really want to talk about how to build your brand in energy. We're going to talk about um, uh, uh, everything from podcasting to social media, uh, things for continuous communication, things like internal communication, uh, ESG, CSR, uh, steering the na narrative, oil and gas, and then the social environment. And so what I wanna start with, uh, Tim, if you wanna jump into this with me, is traditional marketing. Like, what is traditional marketing, Tim? Billboards, uh, commercials, you know, commercials on TVs, um, anything, anything in terms of like anything, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, when I think of traditional, you know, advertising, I think of, uh, when, you know, being a kid and watching advertising on, uh, advertisements on, on TV. One of the reasons why I fell in love with Coca-Cola, I literally have a shrine a Coca-Cola room that's just a Coca-Cola shrine is because they were so good at marketing during, during the Christmas uh, period and I, I love Christmas. Um, and so that, that's what uh, traditional marketing means to me. But once again, I, I grew up in a, in a different, uh, different stage of my life. So Mark, maybe you can touch on traditional marketing in oil and gas uh, 20, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, pick on the old guy. Um, <laughs> so I, I've been in the industry for about 25 years, maybe, maybe 26 by now. And it's a really interesting uh, evolution. So when I started in this industry, traditional marketing, think trade shows, conferences, print, were super important, super relevant. But there was a reason for that, Tim. The reason was there was no internet. So if I was ExxonMobil and I wanted to talk to every choke manufacturer in the world, I would spend the money to go to OTC. Because that's the one place, the one time I could talk to every choke manufacturer in the world. And because that interaction was so valuable, I use it as a business opportunity, as a buyer. So I would bring POs with me. That totally changed the relevancy of conferences when people went there to make business deals. Same way with print. Back then, I probably spent $2,000 a year of my company's money paying for print media, magazines, uh, trade magazines, because it was the only way I could learn. If I wanted to learn something about through tubing services, I could find a magazine for that, and I could learn about that sort of stuff. Um, but then we get to fast forward to now, to where we are in time, and a lot of that stuff I don't think is relevant anymore. Perfect example is the OTC reference. You know, if I'm ExxonMobil, I don't need to spend the money to go to a trade show to talk to choke manufacturers anymore. I could do a two-minute Google search and I can see every one of them instantly. 
Same way with print. Print, the problem with print in today's always gone interconnected world is print is instantly old the moment it's printed, right? So that sort of stuff served its place. It was super valuable 25 years ago, not so much anymore. Mark, I'm very curious if there's anything, any sort of advertisement that stood out in the last 15 years on, tr on traditional uh, mediums, whether that's a billboard or print or at a, at a trade show. Yeah, yeah. so uh, one of the ones that, that stand out to me most in the, in the oil and gas space was about was 13, 14 years ago when BP decided to change its name to Beyond Petroleum, right, from, from a marketing point of view. And they literally paid for billboards on every major interstate intersection in the U.S., right? We are now beyond petroleum, right? And I just thought that was a great traditional marketing campaign. They ran radio spots, TV spots, and it changed people's opinion of what they thought about BP. It took some time. So I don't know what their spend was, but if their goal was to change the way people thought about BP, it worked. You know what's well, interesting? You know, Mark, you're seeing a lot of that happening even now. We've got several companies that are trying to rebrand and rename themselves. It's all coming out sounding like birth control, but they are doing it. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, and, and to your point, Catherine, in this crazy time we're in now, and we're, I don't want to get a sidetrack, I want to stay on, on, the, on track, but in the crazy time we're in now, there's a lot of companies out there, and unfortunately, some people that are going to have to rebrand themselves, but we'll get to that just a little bit later in here. What's really interesting about traditional marketing and advertising, Mark, um, is, you know, <clears throat> you, you kind of had to, like, you know, if, if you wanted your ad um, on a, you know, on, on TV, on a, you know, on a certain network, you have to do some media buying, you have to buy that ad spot, then you have to come up with the creatives, whether it's, you know, uh, a 30 second commercial or, or 15 second commercial. I feel like a lot more thought probably had to go into what that looked and felt like. Uh, to the audience because a lot there was a lot of money in that machine um, and as it became more and more bloated right as things as, as everything around us become grows and becomes more bloated more advertising dollars more spend uh, means that you got to really think about your your messaging um, so I, I wonder you know comparing that to um, to today like if if content uh, 15 years ago was more thought out versus what it is today and if that even matters you know what I mean yeah, it was more thought out. And actually, I'm glad you brought that up. So I wish I would have thought about this before I jumped on. I have a lav mic on, so I can't get up and go grab it. But I have original copies of internal magazines that FMC Technology and Baker Hughes used to do themselves. On staff, they had photographers, writers, editors, printing. And they would they make these beautiful, full-color magazines for their clients. So their clients, it, let's, let's pick up FMC's case. FMC's case, they're a subsea manufacturer. Their clients are the major offshore operators. They went to that expense, Tim, to your point, to, to, to deliver these magazines to the Exxons and the BPs and the uh, SAS oils of the world so they could educate their buyers, right? Think yeah. how much money that costs them to have that entire magazine publishing machine in-house, right? And they quit doing it, Tim. I'm not kidding you. Probably three years, five years ago. I bet it wasn't more than five years ago that uh, they quit doing that. Um, but yeah. that's no longer relevant. What, what's interesting, Mark, is, is my my take on this is I'm, I'm huge on like awareness on the audience. So I don't care if it's commercial on a network or if it's a, a billboard, it's all about the price for attention. Right. And, and we're seeing billboard ads uh, fall drastically. So at some point for some companies that might make sense. So it's all about supply and demand of attention and buying hopefully, you know, underpriced attention um, instead of what we're seeing right now, which is, you know, mostly traditional marketing is overpriced. It's, it's because you're paying a machine that, it, that has grown throughout, you know, decades. Um, and we've seen that we, we, we saw that same revolution with, with radio. Uh, it got bloated and then same thing with TV, it got bloated. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if, if a billboard makes sense for your company, you kind of look into, you know, the, the, the cost per, you know, drive, uh, per uh, driver passing through the, you know, the highway, and it makes sense for you, then, then do that. I'm not here to demonize any sort of uh, campaign. It's just mostly traditional marketing is bloated. Like the OTCs of the world, right? They're paying a lot of money. A lot of these companies are paying, you know, 10, 15, uh, $50,000 to be at a trade show. And so you got to break that up. Yeah. And more than that. Yeah. Like the larger companies are paying a hundred thousand, right? Oh, yeah. The boots alone are just astronomical, and yet the floor space is one of the most expensive parts of it. And what's super interesting about this, Mark, Catherine, and Alex, uh, is that I don't think that trade shows are going away. I just think that the experience is going to change, right? I They're think evolving. Yeah. Yeah. 
So I want to ask you too, Mark, if, I guess, what do we think about traditional branding? So right now, you know, I'm very, I guess, good with the meaning of branding and what that means, but how has branding changed from traditional branding to, you know, what we currently view as branding? Do you think it has changed? Do you think it hasn't changed? It has changed because of y'all's generation. So my generation actually believed the billboards in the magazine ads, right? That's Your true. generation, you know instantly when somebody is just throwing marketing language at you, right? Now it's all about being real, transparent, and helpful in your branding. And that applies to you whether you're an $800 billion a year company or you're somebody that's out there looking for their next role. It's still about being genuine and transparent. I think that age of overhyped marketing is disappearing because it doesn't work anymore. Mm. What's being challenged by the new age of marketing? It's, it's, so it is, not only is it definitely being challenged, it's literally, it's been changing for the last 15 or 20 years. I mean, if you would have told me when we started the first podcast that big companies and big organizations would consider us press, that we have, that members of Congress listen to what we do in order to stay better informed, I would have told you you're insane. And yet it's the truth. It's where we are. It's here. It's, we're here. It's happening right now. Yeah. And I'll even, I mean, to your point, I'll even sometimes Google billboard information as I drive past it. So if it's not while I'm driving, <laughs> only, only if I'm the passenger, but uh -huh. sometimes I'll see things and, you know, immediately I'll just Google it because I'm like, oh, you know, doesn't really sound right to me. I don't know if I believe that message. Let me look this up. And um, yeah, I mean, that's, it's authenticity all the way. So. Yeah, any HSD people out there, just, just ignore what she said about that, right? She, she kills <laughs> I promise. Well, I mean, it used to be, now, Mark, you're going to, you're not going to like this, but it's fine. It used to be that sales and marketing was a college degree, and then it evolved to marketing or business management of some form, and now it's really marketing with a subset of sales because it used to be ABC, always be closing, and now it's first they like you, then they trust you, then they listen to you, and you just don't, you don't have to you know, just make a sale for the sake of marketing anymore. Why would I not like that, Catherine? I, so I agree with you. <laughs> I, I think in today's world, and we're getting off track here, and we haven't started drinking yet. Um, I think in today's world, a good salesperson is a problem solver. You can't make, in today's always on connected, easy to do research world, you can't make a person or a company buy something they don't want. It's just not going to happen. So unless you can help them solve problems, you're not really relevant as a good, as a salesperson, but I want to talk about social media because that's what we're heading to next. How has social media changed th this marketing landscape? There's so, nowhere to hide. So, but let's, let's segue into that with what Perry said on, uh, on, on our chat here. Uh, he had mentioned that, you know, print, uh, print advertising, uh, advertising uh, is apparently still working because he receives, I guess, a lot of junk, uh, junk mail. So, what, what my answer to that would be is you're also seeing that with Facebook advertising. Um, what that might mean is that for the cost of print ad and the amount of effort that it takes to distribute, it might still be worth it for them. You know what I mean? Like it might cost you way more to get specific on Facebook advertising. Like let's say I, I make uh, real estate videos for real estate agents. It might cost me more to, ta to target those people as opposed to instead of $20 per lead, I go down to a dollar and I go for the masses. So once again, it, it's really important to note that it's all about supply and demand of attention and looking at overprice and underpriced um, ad spots. Yeah, so, so when I say it's not relevant, I don't mean it doesn't work. Yeah. But it may be, in the, so there's always a range, right? And it may be that it works, but it's the lowest return for, for your dollar, to Tim's point, when there's other things that give a much better return. Right, you have to look at the ROI. Yeah. 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 So back to my social media question. Let's segue into, into social media, into the new age of marketing, of advertising, the, the rise of uh, social media. Alex, why don't you take it away? Yeah, so, I mean, I guess the essence of, you know, what we're talking about today is, is branding and um, I mean in my opinion branding is kind of an umbrella of sales and marketing and um, social media has just completely transformed both sales and marketing which in turn means it has transformed branding um, so yeah I'll, I'll start with kind of my definition of branding and for me personally branding is establishing and promoting what you stand for right so you know your personal brand is a combination of unique skills that you 
um, have and also the experiences that make you a brand. Uh, and so that's kind of where all of that stuff begins. So personal branding with the evolution of social media has become all about trust. Um, so you can put anything on the internet. Like I said, I Google things constantly. If I, you know, if I call bullshit on, sorry, uh, <laughs> I can't say bullshit. Um, but if I see something that I don't necessarily, you know, believe, I'll, I'll Google it immediately. And I think that's where, you know, I, I hate to make it generational, but where my generation and Gen Z come in is because it's all about trust. We want to trust what we're looking at. We want to trust what we're reading. We want to trust what we're seeing. And if we don't, we're not going to invest in, you know, whatever your message is, whatever your brand is. So it's really just transi transition into this culture where it's, you know, it's all about authenticity and knowing what your market is and knowing what, you know, people will find authentic, which I think I will. Oh, Go ahead, Tim. No, th that's such a good point, uh, Alex, because, and I've seen this through uh, different companies, working with different companies, uh, creating ad campaigns. Um, the, the ads that are, that feel more polished, like, like when you're working with a company, let's say the owner is 50, 60 years old, he has a more traditional mindset in, ter in terms of what an ad should look like, you know, that the whole conventional um, commercial where it's like a 30 second clip, polished, that kind of stuff just doesn't do well versus like a selfie video explaining what it is, you know, to, to use and consume a, a product, to take the product out of its wrapper, you know, eat it, what have you, that kind of stuff tenfold is way better than anything uh, packaged. So that, that's a really, really good point. And that, that lends to your point of uh, authenticity, trust. You, you actually see what the actual product looks like versus a commercial, a rendering, you know, high level rendering. Um, and I think that's super interesting. And I personally have had issues with this too, um, when I'm, when I'm creating a targeting and retargeting campaigns, you kind of gravitate towards like, well, I want to make it a little bit polished, like make it kind of, and it just, you know, side by side, it, it always fails compared to a selfie video or something that's more captivating, um, something that's interesting, share worthy. You know what I mean? Yeah. We have a great comment on the chat box right now. What role does story play in the creation of trust? And we're going to get to podcasting, but the, the reason that the podcasting is so successful is podcasting that's very core is basically education through storytelling. Storytelling is how we all relate. I mean, we're talking about commercials, we're talking about media, we're talking about social media, but the, the, the messages that get told up there, the ones that resonate are the ones that are told in a good story. So what a great comment, that story, uh, uh, the, the ability to tell a good, honest, valuable story is paramount when you're trying to create trust. I, I actually have a personal kind of testimonial to this. So I, you know, coming out of college, I had learned all these marketing um, techniques and all these different things. And I never expected to be in oil and gas and in energy sectors. I did not. So when I came into that and started building, you know, a brand within that sector, I was coming, you know, I was coming in with like product statistics and these really nice pamphlets and all these different things. And um, I realized that, so my company that I'm currently doing all this branding for is my family company. And we have a really, this really incredible story. And um, I mean, the feedback that I got when I actually tell my story is like the difference between uh, a door being shut in my face and, you know, someone inviting me into their home. I mean, it's that much of a difference because when you tell a story with a brand, you know, whether it be through pictures or videos or just like a blog post, people are so much more invested in you and not just the product that you're selling. And I, and I, I mean, that's not even a generational thing. Like I know that we talk about, you know, my generation kind of wanting this authenticity, but that's across every generation. I mean, anyone uh, wants to hear the story. hundred so. percent agree. We got another comment about customer experience. The customer experience is the byproduct of the storytelling and the real transparent, valuable interaction that you have. And whether that interaction is through social or at some cocktail event somewhere, that's where the customer experience uh, happens, is, is after they come in and they develop that trust. Um, so I, I, I gotta ask the team here, so when you're looking at branding, is there, what's the difference or is there a difference between personal branding and corporate branding? Oh, an absolute difference between corporate and personal branding. Uh, I, mean, I know you four know my story, but uh, being someone who did not join the social media realm willingly, I fought it for as long as I could. I joined, uh, as you know, I am an independent podcast in addition to working for OGGN. 
And I started with absolutely no platform. Um, and the results of me starting was I was laid off, opinionated, and honestly a little bored. And I was ready to get back out there and have the technical conversations and pay it forward to industry. And what ended up naturally happening from that was building a personal brand that is almost like a personal loving resume. So I'm seeing some comments about how does a geo consultant uh, sit there and build their brand and energy in order to pay it forward? Well, we have these wonderful platforms that are social media, that are podcasting, that are continuous professional communication. And building your resume is one thing, but putting your acumen to work is a completely different thing. And therefore, you are able to build a brand separate from your company but still honoring, you know, you don't want to go against your company, that probably won't work out well, but still honoring the core values that you bring to the table when inside a company or outside. And I, I have, especially with current, current recent events, I mean, especially in energy, a lot of people are, you know, getting laid off, entering the job search, and I've seen so many people wondering about personal branding in lieu of you know trying to find a new job and i think that you really hit that that nail on the head catherine because um i saw some statistics the other day that over 50 percent of employers now will not hire a potential candidate if they don't see some sort of some sort of online presence mm -hmm. so that's like one in two if they google you they don't see anything they may you know they're, they're just going to put your resume aside or whatever. So, um, yes, that is, that's a huge thing. Just building a personal brand. So step one, you know, building a personal brand, um, create a Facebook profile or not Facebook, sorry, create a LinkedIn profile. Um, if you like tweeting about your industry, create a Twitter profile and, you know, freshen them all up. Like I see dead LinkedIn profiles all the time and people are, you know, entering a job search. So like update your profile picture, um, start writing LinkedIn blog posts, and just really start to kind of like activate those things, um, clean up any content. That's, that's a big thing. I, if I, you know, were entering a job search, I'd probably choose to show my LinkedIn, maybe my Twitter, maybe not my Facebook, you know, you kind of have to pick and choose because that's what we're talking about. Right. So personal branding is cultivating the message that you want people to see. Um, and so we really, with social media, we have this beautiful, ability to do that. And I don't know if anyone else wants to weigh in on just how to freshen up your profiles and maybe some things that are good that you've done of that nature. Well, I can throw something out there. Um, anybody that's, that's listening right now, the audience, if you're in front of a screen, a computer, type in oil and gas sales experts. When you type that in, and I haven't checked in a while, so I maybe shoot myself in the foot, you should see my modal point dominate that first page organically. So I'm not paying for any of that. That's me putting out good, high quality content years ago to the point that if you search for oil and gas sales experts on Google, Google thinks I'm the number one guy on the planet. Now imagine if I was looking for a job and somebody was typed in um, welder uh, in, in Midland or somebody typed in um, project manager or portfolio manager and you came up on top in the search. Think about what that would do for your, your options out there. So for people out there that don't understand the social world is a place that HR checks when they're looking to hire people. Mm -hmm. So you, ha you really almost have no choice but to play in it, but play in it well, play in it right. You know, uh, on your personal social brand, make sure that you um, don't do anything that you would be embarrassed to have to talk to about an employer later. Uh, for your corporate branding, make sure you're transparent and, and honest. Um, I, you know, if you think about the, this podcast network that we all work for, it started six years ago when my marketing guy came to me and said, Hey, we should start a podcast. And I quite honestly told him that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard. Nobody listens to podcasts. Go do something to make me some money. I hope you thanked him in the time. Since. Oh Thank yeah. You. Plenty of times. <laughs> um, I saw no value in something that later would be super valuable. And so eventually I said, okay, not because I thought it was a good idea and I changed my mind. I said, okay, so he could shut up. <laughs> I'm sure everybody has an experience where somebody's nagged you so much that you agree to something just so they'll leave you alone and go away. And so That's how I get y'all to do half the stuff I want to do. <laughs> it's so true. You nag us to death in a very professional, funny way. Um, Mark, so in, in the comments we have from Kurt, uh, he's mentioning Simon uh, Sinek's uh, Start With, Start With Why. Um, I'm great sure, book. Yeah, the book, um, the video. <clears throat> 
So Kurt, um, to that point, like start with why that kind of lends to what Alex was saying, you know, you're, you're starting your personal brand, where do you start? M my two cents on this matter would be, don't get too hung up on it. Just start with execution and you'll figure it out. Personal branding, that's what we're talking about right now. Personal branding, I would start with execution, whether that's, you know, like you might not want to do uh, videos, you might not want to do a podcast, you might be really good at writing, you might be really good at, uh, at graphics, at creating graphics, and that's, that's your thing, that's your IP. Your thing, Kurt, could be, I like posting cartoons, and that's how I affiliate my, my name. That's how I get my message out. Is energy through. cartoons, even. You know, yeah. I've never seen an energy cartoon. You know, just, yeah. What there we go. Creative. Yeah, and we have another comment about there's a bunch of B2C uh, stories being told. Are we going to do any uh, um, B2B? And we are. We're, we're going to get to the B2B part, right? But the personal part is important, even in the B2B part. Absolutely. Yeah, you're known by the company you keep and your reputation does precede you. So if you, and one of my personal mottos uh, that some of our listeners who know me up here in Denver can probably speak to is never play dead. If you have gone through a layoff, if you have been let go for one reason or another, the worst thing you can do is let yourself wallow in it for more than a week. Putting something on your profile such as actively seeking opportunities it adds an air of desperation to the scenario but you've worked hard for that acumen that background that degree whatever it might be and you might very well especially here in the oil field generations deep in knowledge that is irreplaceable knowledge so if that happens to you don't set yourself up for failure by coming across as desperate stick to the never play dead policy Start posting about your acumen, start paying it forward, start building an active, loving resume that, you know, uh, is your reputation that gets your foot in the door and also paying it back to industry because someone will remember the sacrifice that you made to go ahead and help push that forward. And it works every time. Yeah, and that goes back to what we were talking about earlier, a great story. Even on LinkedIn right now, I mean, I have seen so many stories in the energy sector of, you know, people who are going through trials and tribulations right now, and they have thousands of engagements and thousands of likes, because even if you think your story is a failure story, other people see just the beauty and like sharing in that experience. And that's where that story and like the authenticity of social media um, comes in. So yeah, I mean, as far as personal branding goes, I, I always kind of think of, think of it in like three pillars and three main things. And that is just to have your profiles um, and then you want to build credibility, right? So like Tim said, you know, whatever you're passionate about, like, whether you make cartoons or whether you like videos, um, whatever you're passionate about, start posting about it, speaking about it, engaging with other people. Even if you comment on other people's LinkedIn posts about something like that, you're, you're building credibility with them and creating this dialogue where you're, you know, having an audience that you wouldn't normally have. And then once you do that, it, that's when the opportunities come. So you, you target the opportunities that come from that. And obviously you want to start doing that stuff maybe before the job search, if you're thinking about like two years from now changing jobs. But, you know, if you recently lost a job and are looking to build that personal brand, that's just the best way to kind of get things rolling for sure. I mean. And Alex, like absolutely, like you, you said it a couple of times, just start. Like yeah, don't, start. don't think too don't think too much about the why right away. Just start with something. It, it'll look different when it comes out, you know, and, and you'll, and you'll, you'll refi refine the process. But I see far too many people talking about starting and they're too nervous to post because they want it to represent exactly what they believe. Um, and I would just say, just, just post something that means something to you and then move on. Uh, it, it'll get lost in the feed. You know, uh, it's, you, you probably have, you know, a couple hundred followers if you're lucky, maybe a couple thousand. There aren't that many eyes on you at the beginning. So just, just right. start. Um, Even if it you have three likes, it's still something that a future employer will go to your profile and read and see. And that's the thing about LinkedIn. They're not looking at it for how other people interact with you, they're looking at it, how you're putting out content and how you're taking leadership and, you know, putting your ideas out there, which I think is one thing that's really cool about that site. Mm -hmm. we, we have a really interesting comment from uh, Mariska. Um, how do you persuade, uh, persuade engineers? They find it difficult to understand this marketing work. I can so, answer that. 
<laughs> okay, uh, I, I have a really quick tip, and then uh, Catherine, uh, she's all yours. So what I would say, my personal experience would be this. Start with LinkedIn. Start with LinkedIn and get your engineers to post something. Why I say that is because LinkedIn right now is so organic. It's the most organic platform, meaning you don't have to pay to get your message heard. You can literally post anything right now and you'll get some likes and some engagement. And I think that will spark and entice you to post something else. Catherine, all yours. So I am actually an engineer. Um, I've been a reservoir engineer for about four years. I'm late in life, so my first degree is business economics and all that fun stuff. Transitioned over to petroleum engineering, became a reservoir engineer. Now I am an operational engineer. Um, the way you persuade engineers to join the importance of marketing, self-marketing, things like that, is through data. And yep. it's super cool. So Alex and Tim are definitely the creative side of the coin. I am not. <laughs> I want to understand the impacts of the look and feel. I want to understand the reach and the prevalence of the conversation at hand. So every time they talk to you about the look and feel, putting yourself out there, I'm thinking about the data and what resonated versus what did not stick. You know, we're all trying to throw something against the wall and see what lands in the community. But in order to do that, in order to justify it, you got to quantify it. So if you begin, you've got to just keep building and start collecting those data points. And after a while, you'll start seeing trends with those data points. So when we get a little further in, I've got some awesome data points to take you all through. But that's where you start from a personal brand to building a platform to connecting with your company. And I also saw a comment on there. How do you connect your or how do you work with your personal brand while making sure you're connecting with your company? And it's through communication. I have several leaders throughout Denver right now who are building their personal brands coming out of this pivot and trying to figure out what to do and how to do it. They have to relate it back to what their company's missions are. And it could take 7,000 word essays to do that, but you do have to go through that process. So you're honoring both sides of that coin. But data yeah. is the answer to that question or that first question. And yeah, engineers are the easiest in the world to sell to. All you need is an Excel spreadsheet with real data showing the trend and the best, the return on investment, even if that's getting them to post stuff on LinkedIn and, and they'll do it. And if that the is data's so there. Hard it, for me, I don't know if it's hard for you to understand, Tim, but I, uh, emotional brain, I'm so hard for me to understand that. Uh, so uh, back to my point, uh, why LinkedIn is because it does lead to stats, right? So the more you post, the more you can accurately understand wh what your audience gravitates towards. So instead of going so hard and doubling down on one piece of content starting out, you know, post something every day and then the, the metrics will guide you to what people are gravitating towards. So that, that's, that, that's what I would say is execute, start with, start with LinkedIn. Cause I mean, look, if you start with something like Facebook organically, you're not going to get much reach, nope. right? Yeah. Um, Facebook's dying. Well, it's you have to, pay to play on Facebook. If it you're is, not willing okay, to spend so money. Someone, someone yeah. asked about the algorithm algorithms of LinkedIn and that, oh, got brings you. Me back, that brings me back to the LinkedIn Facebook battle. So something that used to happen on Facebook that doesn't anymore is that when you commented on something, a friend would see it even if they weren't friends with that person. So LinkedIn still does that. So if I commented on Tim's status yeah. and you were, or sorry, all of my friends would then see Tim's status on their feed just because I commented on it. Even if they don't like, they aren't connected with Tim and don't follow Tim, which is why LinkedIn is just, really cultivating this like sharing mentality and on Facebook that doesn't it doesn't happen like that anymore and Alex I, I think one of the reasons why is to, to go back to the supply and demand of attention there is there is there are so many people on Facebook there are billions of people on Facebook yeah. versus I think I think 500 million on LinkedIn right so imagine getting notified of every like and comment on Facebook it, it wouldn't be manageable right you know what I mean right. so that, that's what's so special right now about LinkedIn but um, in terms of like the pay to play mark to, to your point, I mean, you know, you don't drive on, you know, you're not driving on the highway and looking at a billboard and be like, well, that should be free. Like, no, like you, you should, you should have to pay for that ad spot. And I would say that Facebook advertising is still wildly underpriced right now. Um, you know, I don't know, you know, whatever product or service you're trying to get to your, to your customer or to a business that utilizes your services, 
for a thousand dollars a month with specific targeting and retargeting campaigns you can get leads um and those leads will you know transpire into into sales so so um let's try to keep get back on track just a little bit it's um, i'm aware of everybody's time let's actually transition now to the power of podcasting um (laughs) yeah um and so tim yes sir why should a company or a person why should they start a podcast um so my take on this would be that it's the easiest way to document it's the easiest way to document long form content for a couple hundred bucks or starting with your phone you could record a conversation um with your friend uh with somebody who you find inspiring you can take that long form piece of content 45 minutes and then you can you can slice it up you can slice it up into 10 15 20 second clips uh, you can make quotes out of it. You can make cartoons out of that, that uh, you know, that long form content too. So it's just a really great way and very easy to capture long form content. So yep. that's what I would say about that. Yeah. Agree 100%. Know how easy it is? How? Okay. So this, this is my data. So as we all know, there are a million podcasts and every single host thinks they are incredible. And if you follow my podcast, you know, I really like my murder shows, but what's so awesome about podcasting is the amount of consumption that Tim is talking about. And on my screen, he's this way. So that's why I keep motioning to him. (laughs) Um, But the average person who consumes uh, podcasts throughout your day, throughout your 24 hour day, That's about a four and a half hour stretch where we are constantly looking to audio. So if you think about someone who happens to, you know, be awake for about 14 hours, that's about 32% of their day. Now, podcasting, which is super cool about this, is the most people who listen to podcasts are between the ages of 25 and 45. And as we know from our industry, those are usually the managers, the decision makers, the money that is behind it. Most are affluent, well-educated, and they're consuming about seven different types of podcast episodes a week. So oil and gas, murder, uh, history, things along those lines. It's a plethora of just constant listening. And we're seeing things, uh, you know, more and more women are listening to podcasts. Men really are the immediate takers on uh, the medium itself, but we're seeing this blow up across the world. And we're seeing in terms of completion rates from listening to beginning and end of podcasts, just as an industry itself, about 80% of all podcasts that are listened to are listened to, to the full extent of the episode, which is awesome. So to Mark and Tim's point, constant, communication through soft leadership to spread your message forward, be you personal or corporate. Yep. And it's the thing I love about podcasting. We've learned this over the years is podcasting. Like I said earlier, is is basically education through storytelling. The thing that's so cool about it is for little money, and it's a few dollars to start a podcast. It's not much, but for little money, you're now competing with the CNNs and the NBCs of the world. You can now get your message out there Whereas 15 years ago, if you didn't have big uh, advertising budgets, you couldn't. Um, And our sponsors love what we do. We literally educate the world on what they do. We don't drive direct sales, but by educating companies and what our sponsors do, the the sales conversation just naturally happens. Mm -hmm. And so it's, um, it's, if you would have told me, you know, seven years ago that I'd be sitting on top of nine oil and gas podcasts with 11 more in the works, I would have told you you're insane. But the reason that works for us is because it works. Um, It's, it's, it's a a wonderful medium for a person to get their message out there, but it's also a wonderful medium for companies to get their message out there. You know what's so, oh, sorry, Catherine. Go ahead. that because I did want to take it back a little bit to corporate branding because we kind of skipped over corporate branding and what that means and you know I would love to hear more as you two as the podcasters I'm not a podcaster everybody but you know the podcasters hear how corporate branding looks first of all and also how podcasts can tie into that corporate branding. Mark I would jump on that one yeah. (laughs) Yeah so corporate branding um our sponsors tend to be kind of big companies, you know, names you've heard of, Amazon and IBM and Technique FMC and Baker Hughes and blah, 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 blah. What they're doing is they're using us because we're the independent third party. They're using us to help get their message out there. 
but they're doing it in a way that is not what, we, what most people in oil and gas would consider corporate marketing. We're telling the stories of their people. We're telling the stories of their customers. We're ter- telling the stories of their successes. We're also telling the stories of their failures. One of the most powerful episodes we ever did is we had Jack Hinton with Baker Hughes, who's, uh, I think he's now retired, but he was head of HSE. And it's, at some point in the past, Baker's safety record was not very good in the US. And a lot of the major operators had decided they weren't going to work with them. And so Jack came in, and he had to fix this problem. I mean, this is a revenue shareholder value affecting problem. And so he went to the executive team and he goes, We have to believe in our hearts that we can have a zero incident day. And the executive team, that I'm paraphrasing, it's basically said, well, we say that all the time in our meetings, but come on, Jack, we're a global organization. We have a bunch of employees. There's no way with the entire organization around the world could go one day without a pinched finger. And Jack goes, that's the problem. You don't believe we can do it. He told that story, that moment of vulnerability on our hs and podcast. He fixed the problem. Uh, when we, as, as the date of that recording, I can't remember how long ago that was, at that date, Baker at that year had 237 consecutive days of zero incidents in the world. How cool is it that he told that story on the podcast and showed the vulnerability of senior leadership? That's a thing that a lot of companies are scared to do. Um, I don't know if I, David Reed's listen to this, but hats off to David Reed with National All Wells Fargo. He came in, he's chief marketing officer, chief technology officer. He came in and convinced management to turn off the ports on the firewall so his employees could use social media while they're at work. Most big organizations would never take that chance. And yet I'm telling you people, you have to do that. You have to tell the real stories of your company. And podcasting is probably one of the best ways out there because think about it. The power of podcasting, besides it being education through storytelling, is the fact that you're in somebody's head. It's not a radio ad. It's not a TV spot. They want to listen to you. When we as an organization skip a show, the first thing we hear is not where's the episode. The first thing we hear is, are you okay? Think about that. Our audiences are so intimately intertwined with what we're doing. They feel like they know us. Um, My team laughs at me because this always happens at some airport. It's always a woman. But I will be somewhere and somebody will hear my voice and they recognize me instantly and they come running up to me and I get full frontal hug, which embarrasses me, but they feel like they know me because they've listened to me for five years. They know my history. You can't buy that type of intimacy and relevance with any other type of digital media. And then the last thing is, think about our sponsors messaging. So we'll take somebody like Red Wing, who unfortunately is no longer a sponsor of ours, not through any fault of ours or any fault of theirs. We're still great friends with them. If you go back and listen to the hs and podcast, you'll hear their messaging, even though they haven't sponsored anything in two years. That messaging is there forever. Mm-hmm. We like them so much, we let them keep their landing page up. So as people hear that you go to redwingshoes.com forward slash podcast, which y'all can do, the whole audience can do this right now, redwingshoes.com forward slash podcast, you'll come to a gated landing page. Those old episodes are still driving traffic to that gated landing page. Red Wing is still developing leads on stuff they sponsored years ago. There's no other digital media out there, Tim, correct me if I'm wrong, where when you quit paying, it still drives traffic. I can't think of any uh, that are as evergreen, especially because, you know, when people do kind of start to trust you, to Catherine's point, they start to trust you, they're like, they're listening to you. They do go back and listen to past episodes, right? I, I find myself doing that um, all the time with a couple podcasts that I listen to. I'll, I'll go back if I'm if I'm up to date, and so all that content is evergreen. So as a sponsor, it's it's a it's well, a very we, we see this in the stats all the time. When a new listener finds us and they like the show, they binge listen. Yeah, you, you take some of our older shows that may be several hundred hours of messaging they hear from our sponsors back to back, and they want to hear it. <laughs> it's it's a totally different game, uh, folks. Well, you know, the interesting thing about podcasting is it is word of mouth just by the nature of the medium, but the way it spreads through most of the world is by word of mouth. It's a recommended, uh, a recommendation from somebody who has heard a podcast, they pay it forward, they recommend the next one. And that's how people pick up on podcasting. It's constant communication. And to Mark's point, being in someone's head, having something constantly resonating and then going out and talking about it and picking up another uh, listener, another follower, it, it's just continuous communication all the way around. Yeah, and the cool thing is people listen to podcasts when they do something else, right? You can't, or you shouldn't, uh, Alex, you shouldn't watch YouTube videos while you're driving. Um, 
Um, but, but you can listen to a podcast while you're working out, while you're commuting. So people are using that unproductive time to be productive and they choose to listen to podcasts. Um, it's, it's one of the things I, I love the best is I have people all over the world reach out to us and go, hey, I was working out and I heard you talk about that new frat hose. And it's like, honestly, I don't even remember what they're talking about because there's so many episodes. But the fact they, they remember it and they reach out and they want to engage about it, that's super powerful. Mm -hmm. And it makes me, well, all of this talk, I mean, to the point I was hammering in earlier about personal branding. Yeah, it, it, Kurt says on the comments, podcasts, yeah, they just have an intimacy that other media does not have. And as far as corporate branding with podcasts, it's so important as a corporate brand to attach yourself to that intimacy um, and to attach yourself to, you know, uh, something that you admire and that is cohesive with your brand. And once you do that, you reach all of these people on such an intimate level that you never would have. For example, um, Amazon Web Services with uh, oil and gas industry leaders. You know, it's, when people think of AWS, they don't really, I mean, me personally, I don't really think of the energy sector. So they have found this way to, you know, engage with these people on a very intimate level that they have, they otherwise never would have reached. And that can't even be done. I mean, it can be done through social media, but not like it can through podcasting. So it's yeah. just a layer to that corporate branding. Yeah, that's the whole reason they came over and decided that we want, want it to work with us is they wanted to get that message out. And it's so funny. Somebody posted a review on Paige's show uh, just in the last couple of days, and they literally said, oh, I didn't know. I always thought of Amazon as the brown box delivery company. And so think how powerful it is. There's one person that we've changed their opinion of one of the largest companies on the planet with yeah. a podcast, you know, and it's, it's, it feels so good to see that type of stuff happen. And Tim, to your yeah. point earlier, I'm sorry, not Tim, to Catherine, to your point earlier about growing an audience that grows by word of mouth. What's really important about understanding that is podcast audiences grow organically. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, I, I can't tell you what super major because we're in discussions with them, but one of the super majors came to me at um, the beginning of this year and they go, look, we've been studying you for six months. We know no matter how big a check we write, we cannot buy an audience as big as yours. So we have no choice but to work with you. And I wish I could tell you the name of the company because it's really funny because if you knew who the company was, you'd go, I can't believe that came out of their mouth, but it did. Well, um, the reality is and in this world today, like I said earlier, there is no place to hide. So the smart approach, even for a company such as mine, started in 1978. It was, you know, they, they formed out of the oil embargo and they weathered the storm, but there was never any need for marketing. And now being in the world that is social media and uh, podcasting and constant communication with so many eyes on our industry. Again, there's nowhere to hide. So embrace it and grow from it or be smothered by it. It's your choice. Yeah, folks, we got 10 minutes left. So I want to get through the rest of the podcast. Uh, They'll need comments of everything. For you two, the two podcasters. Cool. Shoot. Yeah. So if I wanted to start podcasting, if I listen to this and I wanted to start, whether it be like a corporate podcast within my company. Um, corporate podcasts are good for um, informing employees of what's going on. They're also just important for general branding. Or if I wanted to start a personal podcast that, you know, hopefully I could grow so much that a brand would want to be associated with me, um, what would I need to start that? How yeah, so, I get started? so before we talk about gear and equipment, which by the way, everybody that signed up for this, we're going to after sometime right after this, we're going to send you a list of all the gear that we use with Amazon links and we don't have an affiliate program. So just do whatever. But if you're going to start a podcast for me, the biggest, most important thing is the why, whether you're doing it from a cor corporate point of view or whether you do it from a personal point of view, why do you want to start a podcast? And that why is super important. Once you understand the why, then you have to figure out the format of your show. A lot of podcasts are interview style, and I'll tell you a secret that all of the podcasters don't want me to share, is that the interview style is probably one of the easiest ways to get good content because you just let the interviewee talk, right? And you ask the right questions and you listen, and that's engaging and, and valuable to, to people. But there's other formats. You know, we have one that's a topical news show. Um, the problem with that is that the content's not evergreen. If you listen to it three months later, it's not as relevant where some of our HSE or some of our industry leader shows that content's relative years later. Um, 
but starting it literally to Tim's point earlier about social media, I tell every podcaster, do it. You're honestly, you're going to suck when you first start. I tell all my podcast hosts, ask the host on, on here. You said that to me. <laughs> I actually was interviewed by Krista and I can attest to that. It felt horrible. I was like, mm, this just doesn't, <laughs> something just doesn't feel right. Well, Which, one of the other reasons people are need to understand when they start podcasting is that the stats themselves are quite ambiguous. And if you thought that, you know, social media was hard to get a grasp on, uh, podcasting is a bit more difficult in and of itself. But what really matters is the engagement because podcasting is simply a platform. It's a way to spread your message. It's a way to have constant communication, but understanding how that message is resonating is displayed in your engagement. So understanding what that means and what that turns into in terms of data and quantifiable numbers is quite important. Yeah, Catherine, are we at the point where we're gonna talk about some quantifying numbers for us or we're not there yet? We can, I love numbers. <laughs> so let's go through our numbers and then I'll, we'll get toward the end and I'll actually rattle off process and gear and, and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Uh, do you want to make the announcement? Um, so we have passed the 1 million. I'm so proud I'm choking up. We've passed the 1 million download uh, mark as an organization. We're over a million downloads on our podcast together. I never in a million years, pun intended, thought we would get there. It's actually 1,016,055. As of this morning. And that's it's, total downloads of all of our shows, right? Uh -huh. like, yeah, it's total. It's OGGN Network. It's a huge audience. We are in 197 countries. Now, I know that's debatable because it depends if you're like talking to the UN or, but apparently Blueberry, uh, Blueberry Statistics uh, tracks and recognizes all countries. So we're going to say 197 until we're set, done otherwise. Um, you know, one of the advantages for those that are interested in the stats behind podcasting and understanding, so we understand the look and feel, we understand the communication, cool, great, whatever, so now, now data. Um, so the thing about it is almost every person who is a podcaster, including myself being an independent podcaster, the problem is, is you have no one to measure against and you join these groups and you try and figure out like where you fall in the charts and y'all it's just bullshit. Don't even listen to it. The only thing that is truly understand like quantifiable about podcast statistics are really downloads. And you know, one of the advantages of OGGN is that it's a network. So in that particular case, being the executive producer, I go in, and I collect all of these daily download stats from each of these podcasts, and I build them against each other to understand what is landing and what is not. So for your information, if you are starting off as an independent, and again, I had no social presence whatsoever. I barely had 100 friends that I did not know on Facebook. It just was not my thing. And when I started building this, and I, I honestly, I think the people who have platforms to begin with are far more successful in terms of, you know, month over month growth and uh, engagement. But when you start building from nothing, you don't really know if you're doing well or if you're not doing well. So looking at the start of OGGN and then our newer podcast, how, how they're resonating, what the reach is, where our impacts are happening in terms of the global spectrum and, you know, metro areas within the United States, um, you always start with IP30. And I know that's an oil field term. And if you've listened to me on uh, my podcast, you know, I hate it, but it works here. So IP30, if you get your total monthly downloads and you compare those month over month for new episodes, you should see upwards trending. Uh, I saw a question about algorithms and LinkedIn algorithms. I always announce my episodes on LinkedIn and I always check the hashtags prior to posting. So one of the tricks on LinkedIn about hashtags is you really don't want to exceed three to five because it becomes too much to process for the back end. So making sure you're choosing trending hashtags is really key. Um, I've learned just looking at the OGGN stats and my stats, what we're seeing right now is after I post, so I posted an episode uh, with my senior team yesterday, the average life of that podcast is about 
four and a half months. And after that, you see sort of the, uh, the listens and the clicks and the downloads kind of go down over time. Um, and then where you really want to be, if you are downloading, you know, within your first month, over 350 downloads, I know some of our podcasts get well over 3000 downloads within the first 30 days and that's longevity and that's you know personal platforms and making sure you're using all social channels to properly constantly communicate to build that podcast platform uh, you should start seeing yourselves grow to approximately like 650 per episode if not higher and then that alone because there are over a million podcasts out there and we all think we're awesome um, that will put you above the 50% mark and the to, to the 25% mark for downloads, things along those lines. Um, I know for oil and gas this week, they are really at the higher end of that in the 10% worth of downloads per episodes because of the amount of engagement and the longevity that Mark has built over the last, you know, five and a half years. So um, then you can break your stuff down further into where should I be doing events? So. What I am finding is uh, some of our top cities are Houston, Dallas, Denver. We actually are really prevalent in New York and Chicago as well, but then you take it a step further, what types of episodes are resonating there so that when you go in to actually host an event, you bring the same sort of criteria that the audience is absorbing. So right now, you know, in this day and age, Everybody is loving current events, which makes me think that as a species, humans are incredibly dramatic, but it's a good way to know what is landing and what is not landing. So, you know, taking those stats, although they're ambiguous and it's hard to narrow down, uh, understanding like completion rates is something that all platforms are working on right now. Again, the global average is about 80%, but then thinking to yourself, like, how many subscribers do I have? there's no way to know how many subscribers you have. There are back-end ways to sort of approximate it, but you know you have to understand the gaps in your data so you can understand how to effectively utilize the good data that you have, back to reservoir engineering. So the other side is what platforms are getting the most hits. So we all know Apple, I mean, that's kind of the king of podcasting, but Stitcher, Overcast, um, Podcast Addict, those are some of our biggest platforms right now. So making sure that when you start a podcast or when you partner with a podcast, they are hitting some of those uh, bigger platforms to make sure that your listenership has the, the potential to organically grow. I mean, it's you have to find, and as an industry, we're very good at this, you have to find trends in little data and you have to understand what's resonating and what isn't. So, I mean, it's just so cool to see what's been happening with OGDN to compare different podcasts, to see what's landing, what isn't landing, and how you yourself can uh, pivot and tweak and turn. But that's how you get better and that's how you organically grow and that's how you use the platforms out there that are to the best of your advantage. Yeah, very well said. It's a, a just a couple of notes on that. So one thing is, um, and, and this is my this is one of the things I see a lot of podcasters do, both corporate podcasters and personal podcasters, is I think the moment you come out the gate, you should try to find a sponsor, even if it's only $5 a month, because that sponsor is, you'll be now contractually obliged to produce episodes. And most podcasts fail out around the seven or 10th episode. So if you have a sponsor, it's going to make you do it so you get better. And the only way you get better is to do more of it. Like I said earlier, I tell all our new hosts that you're going to suck in the beginning and you, right around the 12th episode, they start getting good. It's the same way personally. Now I want to talk a little bit about, about the nuts and bolts. Are y'all ready to really get into the nuts and bolts of actually doing a podcast? Uh, yeah. So I, I think one point that hasn't been touched on is, um, is uh, like personal development in terms of like the, the feedback loop of hearing yourself when you're, when you're uh, playing back the, the, your podcast. Um, you know, like there's, there's something to be said about, I know for myself, like if I, if I play this, this entire, uh, you know, this entire webinar back, I'll go through and I'll see things that I'll probably do differently next time. Right. So there's that as well to think about. I feel like when you're hearing yourself, you record yourself, you're, you're hearing yourself talk, 
uh, you become more clear at, at communicating. And that's a, that's a very good trait to have. So in addition to the stats, in, in, in addition to starting, that's a really, it's a really good point. Um, I mean, you see this, I'm sure you see this on, you know, YouTube, if you have influencers that you follow, they've been doing it for years. If you try to pick up a camera and you try to, um, you know, reenact what they're doing, it probably won't look the same because it's many years of knowing where to hold the camera, how to communicate, how to get excited. Lighting. Um, sorry? Lighting. 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 Uh, Lighting. Lighting. But we think we sound probably much better uh, than we actually do, right? And so we go back and that's ways to refine too. And I think that that alone is so valuable. If there was no audience, if there was nothing but that, that alone is, is so worth your time to go back. And it also gets your thinking very clean. It gets your thoughts very clear. You know, sometimes we communicate things in a way that makes sense in our head, but when we put it out there, you know, to the ether, it doesn't, it, it doesn't really, it doesn't connect with people. So doing a podcast or recording yourself allows you to refine your thinking, refine your, you know, whatever your message is. So I just wanted to touch but on it's that also too. also very authentic. I, I mean, I think that's the essence, right? You, you get better and you're able to refine, but it's people are on that journey with you. You know, they hear you from the first episode to the 300th episode. Like you guys, I just think had on oil and gas this week, it was 300, right, Mark? 200. We passed 200. 200. Okay, sorry. 200. I mean, like from the first episode to the 200th, you know, the authenticity of that growth is also really incredible. So. And that's that's a really important point because I'm sure we have some people watching this right now and they're thinking, okay, I'll, I'll get started and then maybe I'll get rid of the older episodes when I start. Yeah. Leave them up there. See that evolution. That. Yeah. Yeah. It's, people it's, love the it's, story, like we said. It's way more, uh, you know, relatable. So. Yeah. Yeah, if y'all want to laugh, if y'all really want to see something funny, go back and listen to some of the early episodes of Oil and Gas this week. I'm embarrassed. Yeah. The technical quality is so bad. We get sidetracked about stuff. But yeah. like, like to your point, Tim, we evolved, and it's helped us professionally. Um, and, and also, you know, in our personal interactions with our, uh, you know, other business people, it helps a lot. I got more than once, I've pulled up to a Starbucks I don't normally go through, and I go to order a coffee, and a complete stranger goes, you have a radio voice. Well, the yeah. reason I sound like I have a radio voice is because I've been doing podcasting for so long. And, and it, it shapes the way you pronounce words. It's true. And uh, this is probably a bad comparison, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use it anyways. Um, it, it would probably be like society back in the day when we had no mirrors. Imagine what we looked like. <laughs> I don't no. even want to think. But, but now we have mirrors and we're able to fix, you know, fix things in our face, our teeth that nobody would tell us about. Photoshop. But, yeah. Oh, Beauty filters. <laughs> filters um but but mirrors allowed us to see ourselves and uh you know kind of refine um and sometimes as humans like anything we, we take it too far but uh i'm sure we have a better looking society right now than we did you know uh, a thousand years ago i would imagine right yeah you so. can just look at some pictures of i love to look at old renaissance paintings of like um the royal family of England, you know, back, that's one of my favorite things. So if you have any spare time and you're bored, just go look and you'll definitely see that Tim is right. <laughs> All right. So let's get into the nuts and bolts. Uh, Mark, do you want to? Yeah. Wanna so the, the first thing is, let's say what, a, let's, let's define what a podcast is. Um, a lot of people get uh, YouTube or vlogging confused with podcasting. A podcast is really simple. It's an audio file that's hosted on a audio server that is pushed out to people via an RSS feed. That is the definition of a podcast. Now, I realize that a lot of people interchange the word podcast and um, video and vlogging inter back and forth, and that's fine. But for the discussion right now, I want to make sure everybody's talking the same uh, nuts and bolts. So we're talking about audio files. And it's I talked earlier. face for radio. A <laughs> face for radio. <laughs> um, and, and I talked earlier about how that's important because people can consume that content easier and more relevantly than they can video. Um, <clears throat> so that's what a podcast is. To start one, you need a couple of things. You need a way to record good audio. You need to have the ability to edit it. You need to be able to host it on a podcast platform. And you need to have a way to market it so you can grow your audience. That's, that's it. You literally, the microphones and smartphones, believe it or not, are actually really good. Now the microphone in your uh, desktop or laptop isn't good. So you never want to start a podcast using the microphone. So even though I'm sitting in front of a Mac right now, I have a wired lav mic on so we get good audio. 
This is a $20 microphone from Amazon. And when we send the list of equipment, we'll make sure this is in there. Um, so you need a way to capture good audio. We, as a team, use a, a digital recorder called Zoom. Uh, the reason we do that is, is important. We don't record directly into laptops because we want to take the processing out. The problem with using a laptop to record audio, it works really well, and a lot of podcasters do it, but the moment that processor starts maxing out, the moment it's trying to download a big file, the moment there's an update, it can start dropping audio packets, which decreases the quality of your audio. Um, so you get a digital recorder, a decent microphone. How much an investment is that? We don't use $1,500 mics or $1,000 mics. We use $80 microphones. Audio Technica will be in the list of equipment we send out. $25. Five, how much? $25. $25. Podcasting. Yeah. And so does a $1,500 microphone sound better than an than a $80 microphone? Yes. Does it sound a lot better? No. The other thing is, big shout out to Yeti. Their marketing team is phenomenal. Do not buy a Blue Yeti to record a podcast. It's a, uh, it's, it's a, not a directional microphone. Um, it picks up every little noise, every drop, every scratch on the table, every key punch. They've done a great job of marketing to podcasters. It is not a good microphone for podcasting unless you have a sound booth, a controlled sound environment. So you, you want a, a, a cauteroid or a directional microphone. Uh, you don't, you know, it's gonna be less than a hundred bucks to pick one up. We like the Audio-Technica brands. We plug that into a Zoom digital recorder the, the price for the Zoom recorder is depending on how many microphones you want to plug in at the same time. Um, if you just have two, you can pick up a Zoom recorder for a hundred bucks or so. We use the H6, which allows six different um, microphones to be plugged in. Now here's the next thing. You'll hear a lot of podcasters and you'll see it because it looks cool, say that you need a mixing board. A mixing board is basically a way to bring in a bunch of audio sources, uh, different cable methods, and being able to, to mix those sources together to come out to a single output. You, I don't think a mixing board makes sense for a podcast. I've had five or six podcasters come to me and say, no, I don't wanna edit my audio. So what I'll do is I'll mix it while I'm recording so I don't have to edit it. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> so no mixing board, record your audio tracks separately. You do not want them combined because it makes it much easier for your editor. Right now, if I sneeze, because all this audio is being combined, when we go back and look at the video, you're gonna hear my sneeze. And if I try to edit it out, I'll edit out everybody's audio. If I try to pause my sound, everybody disappears. But if each one of our tracks were recorded separately, like we do, the editor, which is probably going to be you in the beginning, can edit out that sneeze on track one while track two is still talking. So uh, good microphones, but they don't need to be expensive. A digital recorder, a decent place to record. Um, I'm going to tell you something. You get, everybody's going to think I'm crazy except my fellow podcasters. One of those soundproof rooms in your house. Closet. Your closet. closet. Yep. Yeah, yep. I knew it. So when we need to get really good audio until we built this the studio here, we would go in the closet and record because all the clothes block the noise. What you want to stay away from is hard, flat surfaces. So tile is horrible as far as echoes, uh, flat walls. So find a place that, that has carpet, right? If you have a hardwood table, drape a blanket over it. Um, so microphone, digital recorders, now you need to edit. If you're a Mac person, uh, uh, everybody, everything comes with GarageBand. It's actually a great tool to edit audio for podcasts. It's simple, it's easy, it's intuitive. Uh, if you're a Windows person, uh, look at Audacity. Audacity has a lot more feature sets, and it works on Mac as well, a lot more feature sets than um, GarageBand, but steeper learning curve. Um, but there's a free tool, Audacity, that, so you can edit your audio. When you edit your audio, don't get super nitpicky. Um, one of our podcasters, I'm not going to say which name, Paige Wilson, um, is, so picky, the only one. <laughs> is so picky about her audio quality that after it comes back from our editor, she edits it, or she was editing it again. You want to edit out the, the mistakes, but you don't want to make it sound perfect. If it sounds perfect, it sounds too corporate. Right? So it's actually kind of cool to have a little crowd noise if you're recording at an event somewhere. Um, if the neighbor's dog barks, talk about it. Say, oh, I can't believe you barked. Everybody's going to hear that. Don't make it sterile is what I'm trying to get across to you. So you've recorded your audio. You've edited it. Um, now you need to get it out in the podcast world. There are several podcast hosting services. Um, the one thing I will tell you is before you sign up, um, and I may be wrong about this about Anchor because I haven't checked Anchor in a while. But, it, but before you sign up, some podcast services own your RSS feed. And remember, that's the connector between you and your audience. So that the mobile app Anchor, 
and like I said, I could be wrong about this, um, but in the past, if you signed up and built your podcast on their platform, they owned your RSS feed. The problem with that is if you ever left to another platform, they keep all your reviews and all your listeners. You'd have to start from scratch again. We made that mistake a long time ago. Um, uh, Lipsum's a good one. Blueberry's good. And Podbean's a good one. We're a Blueberry user. It's not very expensive um, to start. Now, if you grow <laughs> like we have, it does get expensive later, but it's worth it. But you need a place to host those audio files that can push them out. Yeah. Now, the next thing is, do you need a website? No, yeah. but the website makes it so much better, right? So we're big WordPress users. WordPress is, if you can build your Facebook page, you can use WordPress, um, but you need a platform that will host the player of your podcast provider of choice. So in our case, uh, we use Blueberry to, to host the files. Blueberry then has a podcast player that we can actually put on the websites. Uh, just FYI, everybody, about 98% of all podcast traffic is on mobile. So it's 2% or less is on desktop. Um, because of our industry, our percentage that's listened to on desktop is much higher than the norm. I'll let you try to figure out why, um, but, but, it's, but it's there. So now you need to, um, so we suggest you build a website. Tim, you can build websites nowadays almost for free, can't you? Yeah, literally like a WordPress theme site can, you know, I mean, if you're talking like a, like a generic theme, like $50, uh, you go to uh, themeforest.com, you can get a, a generic theme. Um, and it's pretty, it's pretty simple to use. Yeah. So, I mean, assuming that you want to use it for, for basic purposes, right? So, yeah. yeah and I so, see a question down there saying, uh, do we edit in-house or do we send yeah. out? I know OGGN has an editor on that I manage, uh, but in terms of poor girl podcasting, I do my own edits for my episodes and I know everyone at OGGN started that way. So, I mean, it is time consuming it. You, there is, from beginning to end, an episode can take anywhere from 10 to 15 hours to, you know, prep to production, but it, there are different ways around it. There's, it's, it's work. Honestly, recording the audio is the easiest part. Editing yeah. it is the, by far the most difficult. My entire team cheered when we finally got to the point financially we could hire an in-house editor, right? <laughs> So, so if you start and do it yourself, but that's another reason to get a sponsor, not just to make you do it, but with a little bit of cash flow, you can hire an editor quicker. Yeah. Um, so now you have the edited episode, you need to push it out. Your podcast provider of choice will have the connectors to all the podcast players. iTunes is 800 pound gorilla, depending on who you believe, it's between 70 and 80% of all podcast traffic in the world. The thing about iTunes is they're picky and you have to make them happy. Yeah. So in our case, if you listen to any of our new shows, you've noticed that we released this episode zero thing, which is like one of us talking for five minutes and not, not, nothing relevant. What that really is a placeholder in iTunes. You have to apply for your account in iTunes and they have to approve it. Mm -hmm. um, Catherine, that can take up to what, five or six business days sometimes? Yeah, it depends. And honestly, there's also the trick of you want to be new and noteworthy. And if you have to, if you want to hit that, you need to submit at least seven full episodes completed in order to hit that. So the more you have to submit to Apple, uh, the longer it'll take for them to approve. And just, it, it doesn't matter if it's a five minute whole placeholder video, if Apple's not on it, or if they've got a backlog, it could take 30 days. You just have to know that uh, it's not going to be instantaneous by any stretch of the imagination. So you just gave away one of our secrets. Okay, so how many people do we have on this call right now? I can't, was it like 80 something? 75. 75, yeah. okay. So team and my 75 people to listen, we're gonna share an iTunes secret with you. Y'all have to keep it quiet. We cannot let Apple find out what I'm about to say. Um, so, and I'll get to that in just a minute. So now you have to launch. The cool thing about using a podcast provider like Blueberry is they have all the connectors. So when we, when Catherine, hits post it instantly goes to itunes stitcher google play um podbean every place so every place that you would want to consume a podcast it's instantly pushed Catherine doesn't send it to each one of those things she presses post one time and blueberry for us handles that ellipsum's another great one like i said there's several of them out there so now your show has launched now the, the thing that Catherine mentioned because Apple is 800 pound gorilla. They're, they're literally the most important game in town for, for all podcasters, us included. And there's a section in iTunes called new and noteworthy. So if you launch your podcast and you don't appear in new and noteworthy, you're going to pick up a couple hundred listeners, right? In the first couple months and you're going to grow 10 to 15% per month. 
if, however, you would appear new and noteworthy, instead of picking up a couple hundred, you'll pick up several thousand because you're, you're being highlighted mm -hmm. and you'll still grow 10 or 15% per month. But at the end of the year, that audience size can be a much bigger number because you had exponential growth because you appeared in new and noteworthy. So the secret there is you launch episode zero to get Apple's approval, right? After you get Apple's approval, as long as somebody doesn't give you a strike for anything, you're done. All your episodes are automatically pushed out. You then record at least five, if not more, seven, right? And you launch all five or seven on that next round all at the same time. You wait 24 hours and then you call everybody, ex-girlfriends, grandmothers, your people you work with, get them to leave you reviews, right? If you do that, the odds you appear in new and noteworthy are super high and this can lead to future huge audience growth. Mm -hmm. So I just gave y'all away one of our secrets. I'm not giving them all away, but that's actually a good one to know. Now, if any of y'all blab that, Apple's gonna hear it and they're gonna change the algorithm. So you'll ruin yeah. it for all of us. So don't tell anybody that. So Mark, that's your counterpoint's telling us it's time to wrap up. <laughs> you see what Paige wrote? <laughs> it's like we have time to wrap finish. up. Yeah, she's okay, like, <laughs> she's right, she's right. Or I'm right to myself. I'm not sure how that works, but we do <laughs> get out of here. So we have so, some questions that people ask. Y'all want to? Yeah, let's go through the questions. Let's yeah. go through questions. Um, and, and once again, people, I know we said we'd be on here for an hour. If y'all need to drop off, drop off. Everybody that joined will get the list of the gear that we use. Um, and it, we appreciate y'all showing up. But yeah, if y'all want to stick around, also, and do Q &A, let's do Mark, it. Someone, someone asked if they could, if the video would be available later for yeah. replay. Yes, it will be available on all of our social medias. Um, on OGGN's LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. So you'll find that and be able to rewatch it there if you need to tap out right now and want to watch the rest of it later. Okay. So, so do y'all want to jump in Q&A? Let's do it. Yeah. All right. Um, somebody else read the questions. Um, a lot of B2C. Okay, I think we already answered that one. Um, well, will you speak to B2B in this crisis from Olaf? Yeah, who? In so, oil and gas B2B specifically. Yeah, so let me tell you one of the things that happened when this whole COVID-19 thing, uh, lockdown happened. I really thought I was have to fight to hold on our sponsors and complete opposite has happened. So unexpectedly, what's going on is you have companies that still need to get in front of prospects, still need to educate existing customers, but their conventional marketing methods don't work because everybody's locked down at home. However, since everybody's locked down at home, they're bored and they're listening to our podcast. So our consumption has actually went up. We are still have a huge ability to reach these people that are locked down at home. Um, the amount of inbound leads that we received from large companies has went up, it's quadrupled in the last say three weeks because all these large companies realize that we are one of the few avenues where they can still communicate with their prospects or their customers. So if you're in a B2B world at oil and gas right now, um, start a podcast. Um, <laughs> Um, I mean, seriously, it, because this COVID-19 lockdown won't be the last one. Um, you know, you're going to see more of this stuff as we go through time. It, they'll all be better because this is the first one we went through. So it was scary because nobody had experience. In the future, we'll have experience. But this is a communication method that, that just has held up during this lockdown. And actually, not only it's held up, it's, it's blossomed. Um, you know, other than that, Tim, I, you know, any insights on B2B marketing while everybody's locked down? No, I, I, I think you I think you hit you hit it on the on the nose here. Um, but if, if we can answer a couple more questions, um, LinkedIn algorithm. Catherine touched on that a little bit. Um, I feel like there's a lot of speculation with with algorithms when it comes to like you know how to like kind of like game uh, you know a, a certain platform. I, I would say for sure hashtags work um, in LinkedIn. Like definitely they definitely work. But aside from that, I wouldn't think too much about it when to post. Just just post when, especially now, everyone's on their screens. Just just post whenever. Uh, don't don't get hung up over those things. Um, the, don't the, try the, to game the algorithms because you will get punished. Yeah, the, uh -huh. the the metrics will guide you. If you post every day, the metrics will guide you. You do that for, for three to six months. You you'll know what trends you're hitting based on your content. Mm -hmm. um, 100%. I, I also have something to add to that. So I'm not sure how big or, or uh, how large scale or small scale you're talking about, but something that I did within like the first week of this crisis was that I just went through every single business card um, or CRM contact that I had added. And I contacted every single one of them and asked, you know, hey, how's everything going? How's your uh, business going? Have, have things slowed down for you? Have they sped up? You know, is your family safe? 
just to just because you genuinely you genuinely want to know and I think that's kind of the running message that we're learning with marketing during all of this is that it's you know this is really when those personal connections are going to come through and showing like a general kindness and I guess sense of humanity is, is what it's all about. So that's something that I did for marketing during COVID-19 and that was B2B marketing. That wasn't B2C. That was contacting other businesses that we work with. Yeah. And, and also keep in mind that like, you know, your content shouldn't, shouldn't mean something to everyone, you know, but maybe it means something to, to one or two people at the beginning. Right. And then you grow from there. And then there's also something to be said about like, like, what are your goals? Is your goal is or was one of your goals to grow this podcast in terms of numbers, or is it to you know grow your network? Um, people have different varying goals, um, and that that's a good you know it's a that's a play at hand here. Um, that can be said for all content, not just podcasting. What is your end goal? Is it personal or is it professional? Yeah, it looks like we got another question. Explain in a little more detail what sponsoring means in terms of content. So, we naturally get this question every day. Um, couple things. So podcasts are not good at selling anything. When a company comes to us and they want us to sell a widget with a podcast, we tell them politely, no, it's just not a good platform for that. Podcasts are great at education. So when a company comes to us like IBM and they go, hey, we have this problem in oil and gas. Everybody still thinks we manufacture boxes and we haven't manufactured boxes in 17 years. Can you help us with that? And, and we go, yeah, we can change that narrative. We can tell that story. Uh, we actually did it with IBM so well that a COO of a major operator uh, reached out to us and goes, I was listening to your podcast and I didn't know IBM had domain expertise. I didn't know IBM had uh, oil and gas project managers and petroleum engineers and geophysicists on staff. Can I talk to them? Bottom line, they closed a two and a half million dollar deal because of podcasts. Um, but with all that said, we never never let our sponsors get salesy. So as far as content, what we give to our sponsors is a couple of things. Uh, we, we, we help educate our audiences about what our sponsors do. Um, at the same time, we give our sponsors access to all of our shows. So each show has a different audience. The audience makeup of our hs &E show is radically different than the audience makeup of our tech show. However, if you notice, we've had IBM on all of our shows or almost all of our shows for that reason. So now IBM's getting exposure to niched audiences. And what we do is we tell the story to that audience in a way that showcases the sponsor. I'll give you a great example. So we tell the story on our hs &E show of how IBM is using big data analytics to make people safer. That's mm -hmm. not salesy. That's being very relevant. It's educating our audience. But guess what? There's some hs &E manager whose ears perk up. Wait, you can reduce lost time incidents, IBM? Let me call you. So so the content we let our, our, our sponsors put out there is not marketing copy. Uh, we do a little bit of that. Uh, we do try to drive some hard metrics as far as driving uh, people to a gated landing page uh, so that our sponsors actually get contact information, that, that, that data, that contact information should be dropped into some uh, marketing automation or hand it to an inside sales team. But we don't do shows about our sponsors. If, if you listen to any of our podcasts, our sponsors actually are not on the shows that often, although we do talk about some of the cool stuff they do on all the shows. So hopefully that answers your question. If, if you want more details about that, reach out to me directly and we can jump on a call or have an email exchange. But it's, it's not advertising. Remember, podcast is not advertising. It's, it's literally storytelling, right? But you want to tell that story in a way that drives good benefits for our sponsors. And I think we do a pretty darn good job of that. What else do we have? Um. Pascal says, uh, during these times, what is the best message strategy for a startup? Um, Who? Yeah. Okay. And then they go on uh, to talk about, you know, uh, the best message to, for like pr prospective wow. customers. And, and what my point on that would be, I wouldn't start making content uh, for prospective uh, clients. I would, I would make it, you know, just, just start with. Authenticity. Yeah. Just the start authentic. with a story, a photo that means something to you in, in some way, something that inspires you, uh, something that, that you saw that inspires you right now, that that, that, that would go a long way. Um, and then grow from there. But, but really, I think a key takeaway is to not overthink it, right? Just, yes, speak to your passions. Kurt, Kurt has it uh, down pat. Yeah, speak, speak to your, cash, your passions and don't overthink it. Just start. Like, you'll, you'll figure it out once you start, right? Okay. Um, yeah, you know, startups are a unique place. They, they typically uh, have horrible cash flow. 
they typically need to hurry up and get some relevance, right? So they, they need some logos and need to land some big deals. And during this lockdown time, um, unless your startup somehow affects that, um, I can give you a good example. So there's a startup called Hitch, which we love those guys. And so one of the cool things that their platform does, they, they basically allow you to use an app to get supplies and equipment to your, your job sites. One of the cool things that their, their, their platform does is there's less people involved. Well, guess what? When you're worried about c catching COVID-19 and there's less human to human contact, wouldn't it make sense to use the technology? So there's a startup that was able to capitalize on not their core competency, but on a side competency of what their platform did. So, you know, if your startup can somehow be tweaked so it, it shows that you can help in these, this lockdown time, do it, run for it, promote it, right? Get that message out there. Mm. Yeah. Well, heck, I think we're going to have to do another one here soon. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. I, I tell you what, audience, whoever's left, um, it looks like we probably would want to do another one of these. Um, if y'all could just, in the chat box, um, or reach out to us directly, um, let us know what you'd like the next one to look at. This is the first time we've done this. Our goal in all of this. I'll handle that. <laughs> okay, send it to Catherine. Our goal in all this is, is, to, is to provide values to educate so that you can do this. So you can use podcasting and, and, and other platforms to help promote your personal brand or your company. Um, and hopefully we've given you some good information. Like I said, we're going to send a list out to everybody of the gear that we use. Um, but you know, do y'all next time do you, the audience, do you want us to go super deep and super techie into what podcast does? Do you want us to back up and look at bigger picture stuff? I'd love to have your input on what, what our next uh, Zoom uh, webinar, uh, what it should look like.